Welcome back. Margaret Thatcher's supporters say she saved the country from economic ruin and boosted Britain's influence on the global stage. Her critics dismiss her as a vindictive anti-labor crusader who hobnobbed with some of the worst regimes of her time. To talk more about that, I'm now joined from London by journalist and political campaigner Peter Tatchell. He is also a member of the Britain's Green Party. Welcome to the show, Peter. Which camp do you find yourself in? I'm very firmly of the view that uh, Margaret Thatcher was bad for Britain and particularly bad for the poorer, ordinary person who didn't have wealth and power. Uh, for those people, during her premiership, they suffered very, very greatly. Now, one of the things that uh, people have been talking about is her attempts to go after the big unions. She described them as uh, inefficient, wasteful. Uh, in, in fact, uh, when the uh, mining industry went on strike, she even went as far as to call them the enemy within. Uh, what's your take on that, and uh, what's her legacy there? Well, the miners' strike was in 1984-1985. It was the biggest industrial action for many decades. And to suppress it, uh, Margaret Thatcher put the country under de facto martial law. Uh, and martial law was never declared, but police state methods were used to suppress the miners and their supporters. For example, um, people traveling to mining communities to give them support were stopped and either arrested or turned back. Um, I was eyewitness to police charges on horseback with uh, three-foot batons attacking entirely peaceful miners on strike protesting to save their jobs. Uh, it was an extreme situation where extreme methods were used by the state to suppress a industrial action which was designed to save Britain's coal industry for the future and to save the jobs and mining communities. So I stood with the miners against the government. But there are those, her supporters, who spent a lot of time in the last few days uh, talking about uh, this particular case and saying that, you know, in, in many of these cases that she brought the country back from the brink of economic catastrophe. I mean, you even heard your prime minister saying that she saved our country. Um, what about those who argue that, uh, that she really kind of needed to do something about the stranglehold of unions? Well, of course, she does have her very loyal, strong supporters. And they are mostly people who are well-off, influential and powerful, who benefit great, benefited greatly from her rule. Um, during the Thatcher years, the rate of tax on the very rich was almost halved, yet the number of people in poverty more than doubled. So we had a nation of haves and have-nots. So she may have um, restructured the economy, and that may have been beneficial to some people, but the price paid by millions of ordinary people was very, very high, both in terms of the decimation of our manufacturing base. Britain has historically, or was historically, a great manufacturing nation. She basically said those, those were old-fashioned traditional industries. She didn't care about them. They were labor-supporting areas. Um, she was happy for them to go to the wall. And as a result, um, Britain lost much of its manufacturing base. About at least a third of our manufacturing base went to the wall. She shifted the economy over to the service and finance sector and had a policy of very light regulation, which actually created the conditions that led to, eventually, the economic chaos of the last few years. The banking crisis and the economic downturn uh, since 2007, 2008 can be traced back to Margaret Thatcher's um, advocacy of free markets and light regulation, where she allowed businesses to more or less do what they wanted to. Peter, there was some regulation, that's true. But, well, Peter, let me, I, I hate to interrupt, but let me ask you this then. Um, and, and uh, you know, when you look back on, on her legacy, uh, there were points where her. Uh, approval ratings dipped down to about 25 percent, but yet this was a woman who stayed in power for 11 years. Um, th why so many supporters? You say that it, the, the country is divided in many respects, those who love her, those who hate her. Um, why so many people in her camp? Well, under Britain's antiquated, unjust electoral system, Margaret Thatcher never won 
a majority of the public vote. Because we have quasi-gerrymandered constituencies, she was able to win landslide majorities based on the support of only 40 to 42 percent of the electorate. So um, that is one of the reasons why she got into power and stayed in power. But it's true she did pursue populist policies like the Falklands War, um, like giving uh, municipal uh, tenants the right to buy their properties. But the upshot of that latter policy is that today there is an absolute chronic shortage of social housing and there are more than a million people in desperate need who cannot get social housing because those properties have been sold off and they're now in this private sphere. So of course the people who bought their council properties, their municipal properties, they benefited but the social housing need has actually been uh, exacerbated and the available stock greatly diminished. Let's talk a little bit about foreign policy. Um, she described Nelson Mandela as a terrorist uh, and, and uh, David Cameron, even when he visited South Africa, had to kind of backpedal in 2006 and apologize for, for some of her policies. Um, why was she close, so close with the apartheid government? Well, for Margaret Thatcher, although she extolled freedom and, to give her credit, did a uh, you know, crusade against totalitarian communism in the Soviet bloc, um, her idea of freedom was predicated on anti-communism. Um, so anybody who was against communism was a potential ally. So she sidled up to President Marcos in the Philippines, King Fahd in Saudi Arabia, President Suharto in Indonesia, General Pinochet in Chile, and the apartheid leader P.W. Bota in South Africa. She was prepared to say, well, we can accept that these people are nasty, but we'll, we'll do business with them, we'll support them because they're anti-communist. So really in many ways, she supported regimes uh, that were just as bad, really, as the communist regimes that she, she deplored and oppose. Well, Peter, you're hearing a lot of positive uh, uh, comments there in London. Uh, we have a clip we want to play for you. This is an ANC spokesperson reacting to her death, and I want to get your reaction to what he has to say. Let's listen. Margaret Thatcher turned a blind eye to all those atrocities that were committed by the apartheid regime, and that propelled the regime. It made it stronger. Uh, it made it invincible. It made it to think that nothing could happen to them. You will know that she stood fast. Even when we were calling for the release of Mandela, Margaret Thatcher says, no, he's a terrorist. So let me get your thoughts on that part of her legacy. Well, of course, she never personally supported apartheid, but she believed that the South African apartheid regime was a bulwark against what she saw as the spread of communism in Africa. Now, in Margaret Thatcher's view, anybody who was vaguely left was, you know, a quasi fellow traveler of communism. So even if they weren't actually communist, um, if they were left wing, if they wanted to rebalance wealth and power in favor of ordinary people, she saw them as, you know, fellow travelers with communists. So she therefore um, did not support the African National Congress and the movement of black people in South Africa to win their freedom and the right to vote. Um, she felt that that right and that freedom had to be sacrificed to what she saw as the more important goal of defeating communism in Africa. And I think that was a tragic, tragic mistake because right to the very end, she defended and apologized for the apartheid regime. She went out of her way, barnstorming around the world, to oppose sanctions against the South African regime, sanctions which, had they been introduced earlier, may well have brought the apartheid regime to an end much sooner. Uh, John Bryan Starr has this book out, Understanding China, and uh, there's an interesting excerpt about Margaret Thatcher where he illustrates that she did not understand China, that when she went there in 82 to Beijing and met with the Chinese leadership, that she touched some raw nerves, and the result was Hong Kong was returned to Chinese uh, sovereignty in 1997. Um, that was not her desired effect when she went to have this meeting. How did she handle that, and how will she be viewed in terms of the transfer of uh, Hong Kong back to China? I think the, the, the 
legacy is very mixed. Um, quite rightly, Hong Kong belonged to China. It was a British colony seized by military force, held by military force as part of British governments, successive governments, a shameful imperial colonial history. So it's quite right that Hong Kong should be handed back. It's true she never wanted to hand it back. Um, and, you know, she did initially fight tooth and nail to hang on to Hong Kong. Um, I can only say that I think that the um, compromise agreement um, where, in effect, you know, Hong Kong is a special part of China uh, was probably the best deal she could have got at the time. And I doubt that anybody else could have done anything better. So I don't think that's a terrible um, negative mark on her premiership, except that initially, of course, she didn't want to give it back at all. She wanted to hang on to it uh, as part of Britain or, or, or as part of British overseas territories, as, of course, she's, she sought to hang on to the Falklands and indeed did. Peter, thank you for the story and thanks for your observations. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you.